For a man who called his dog Blockhead and affectionately referred to his wife as My Lord, it seems unsurprising that the challenge he brought to the church was deep and wide. Luther professed to have no personal ambition in his reform initiative and refused to take credit for what transpired within the Christian church. When it was all said and done, however, Luther had performed for religion what Copernicus and Galileo did for science. The focus of the Christian religion was entirely changed. Now, the center of the faith was no longer good works, human righteousness, and religious observation. In its place, Luther preached a message of Christ and Calvary, a proclamation that removed men and women from the focal point in the matter of salvation, which was the entire point of the church anyway. His doctrine of justification, salvation by faith alone, could not be regarded as mere academic squabbling or intellectual posturing. It refocused the heart of the faith. It was hugely contentious. It shattered the unity of Western Christendom. It was Luther's challenge to the church. We begin with four comments from Martin Luther himself. First of all, he says, The one thing I ask is that people should not make use of my name and should not call themselves Lutherans, but Christians. What is Luther? The teaching is not mine, nor was I crucified for anyone. How did I, poor, stinking bag of maggots that I am, come to the point where people call the children of Christ by my evil name? Secondly, I simply taught, Martin said, preached, wrote God's word. Otherwise, I did nothing. And then, while I slept or drank Wittenberg beer with my Philip and my Amsdorf, the word so greatly weakened the papacy that never a prince or an emperor did such damage to it. I did nothing. The Word did it all. Thirdly, I did not learn my theology all at once, but I had to search deeper for it, where my temptations took me, not understanding, not reading, or speculation, but through living, indeed through dying and being damned, makes one a theologian. And finally, I did not want the responsibility, and I did not understand the issues, and the song might prove too high for my voice. I have given these four comments from Martin Luther to set the stage for a discussion of Reformation theology. We are going to stick with Luther quite a bit during this lecture. A major turning point in Luther's life came in 1505, as we have learned previously, when he entered the Augustinian monastery in Erfurt. Whatever may have been the occasion for Luther to enter the monastery on the 17th of July, 1505, the ultimate reason cannot be in doubt. He became a monk to save his soul. The principal motive was not the hope of heaven or the fear of hell. Principally, it was a sense of a 22-year-old man wanting to be in a proper relationship with God. He wanted to be sure at the age of 22 of his standing with God. He wanted to know where he was in relationship to God. And more than that, he wanted to find a gracious God. And monastic vows seemed to Martin Luther, at the age of 22, to be the most certain means to that end. In fact, Martin would later write and tell us, I made the vow for the sake of my salvation. Well, surrounded in the chapter house by Augustinian friars in 1505, the prior of the cloister, the head of the monastery, 
asked Luther if he was prepared for the severity of life in the order. Was he prepared to renounce his own will, to accept the simple diet of the monks, the rough clothing, the vigils through the night, work during the day, the castigation of the flesh, the disgrace of being poor, the shame of having to beg, the fatigue from fasting, the weariness of seclusion. And Martin Luther said he was ready to accept all of these things for the salvation of his soul. Now we must keep in mind, as I have mentioned previously, that Martin Luther was a product of the Middle Ages. These Middle Ages where they built churches like fortresses to shield the faithful from the world. Uh, centuries of time where superstitious beliefs ruled the minds of men and women. A world where the devil was absolutely real, and he certainly was real to Luther. Where evil spirits predominated, and even in the cloisters and the convents you had to do spiritual battle against the demonic forces of hell and these Middle Ages where monasticism was the one path to God and the spiritual life that seemed certain. Well, monasticism was an accepted part of Christianity. Almost every region and town in Europe had tonsured men and veiled women living their religious life. Fostering a contempt for the world these men and women, Luther among them, embraced this heroic vocation. Distinctive clothing. You could tell a monk or a nun when you saw them because of their clothes. They were distinguished by the rituals that they observed. Musical traditions. An aura of holiness, if you will. And a common, simple life committed to the principles of poverty, chastity, and obedience. And the vows that these men and women made, again Luther among them, was a means of achieving stability in relation to God. They separated themselves from the world for the purpose of what they called the work of God in order to find holiness, in order to find salvation, in order to assure themselves of being in a proper relationship with God. Now the Augustinians of the later Middle Ages practiced a rigorous asceticism, this severe lifestyle. In the registers of the prior general, we find this instruction dating from 1488. It's an instruction to one of the monastic communities in Germany. It says, the brothers in the order must fulfill the commandments of the church. They must recite the divine office day and night. Follow the calendar of the curia for the prayers. They must chant the hymns, the Te Deum. They must observe the saints' days, the feast of the apostles. They must chant two masses on the vigils and on feast days. They must observe the canonical hours. They must say Mass with the greatest care, confessing according to the laws of the order. They must observe all of the rites of the church and take heed to the appropriate ritual and vest to put their proper clothing on for the Mass, for the divine liturgy with decorum and conform to the liturgical season. I've abbreviated it. There's a lot of rules and regulations that these people engaged in. But the question is this. Was the monastic life the best way to get to God? Was this religious life the surest path to salvation? Well, Luther thought it was in 1505, but he would later write, and he would say, when I was a monk, I seriously believed that I could secure justification through my works. I was confident that I could. Well, Luther was in the cloister, as we know, at Erfurt between 1505 and 1511. 
but he wore his monastic cope, his habit, until 1524. He claims to have been a good friar and to have observed very strictly the rule of the order. In fact, Luther says, you know, if it were possible to get to heaven by observing the monastic rule, I certainly would have been saved because I exceeded the letter of the law. However, as I have mentioned previously, despite his piety, despite his efforts to do good, to find God in his own way, he was beset, absolutely beset, while in the monastery, by constant Anfechtung. Now this word is a German word, Anfechtungen. It's very difficult to translate. Uh, various possibilities are put forward. It encompasses things that we would describe in English like struggles, conflict, turmoil, almost a wrestling, and I don't mean a, a physical wrestling with another person, but this inner struggle. And so Luther used this word anfektung. He was beset by these conflicts and struggles and, and turmoil in his life, and he begins to look elsewhere. He begins to look beyond himself, beyond the cloistered walls of the monastery. And the song, remember that I began with, he was afraid the song would be too high for his voice? The song begins to test his voice. And he starts to learn theology. Remember the comment I made at the beginning from Martin, only by living and dying, only by being damned, can you be a theologian? So the song is testing his voice and he's beginning to learn theology. His struggles deepen, however. So he reads Paul, St. Paul the Apostle, and he encounters faith. And I want to say something about faith as we go in this lecture, for it is very important. At length, Luther concluded that his monastic vows conflicted with faith. And I, I want you to be very clear that faith needs to be defined and understood quite specifically, and I will come to that. Luther came to the place where he found monastic vows and faith to be in conflict because the vows embraced works and what you do rather than God's grace and God's mercy. Well, now the song is getting pretty high for Luther's overstrained voice if we use the analogy of singing. Luther says, although the fathers were often wrong, now he's referring here to Jerome and Augustine and Gregory and Hilary and Chrysostom and the rest of them, he said still they ought to be praised because of their witness to faith. Jerome, Gregory, and the rest of them, they believed as we do as the church has believed from the beginning. He refers then to Bernard of Clairvaux. He said, Bernard was magnificent when he taught and preached, but he tended not to do so well, Luther said, when he got into disputations, for there he contradicted himself. Now the crucial issue for Martin, and indeed for the Reformation in general, was this, how are sins forgiven? Or how can an individual be put into a proper relationship with God? The category is the doctrine of justification. And this, of course, invites the obvious question. What is sin? It sounds like a very obvious question, but if we're going to talk about being, having sins forgiven, what exactly are sins? Well, in general, it's any act any attitude or any action which impedes a proper relationship with God and humankind. Now, of course, there's major sins and there's minor sins. Among the venial sins, the, the minor sins, sleeping too much was thought to be a venial sin. Excessive talking, being annoyed. We don't even think of these things as sins today. You can sleep all day, sleep all night. Nobody thinks of it as sin. In the Middle Ages, it was minuta peccata, minor sin, a minute sin. 
And nobody was too fussed about those. You had to confess. The major sins, however, were the mortal or the deadly sins. And in the Middle Ages there were seven of these, the seven deadly sins. These were lust, greed, anger, pride, gluttony, envy, and sloth. These were serious, deadly sins. Well, what has the Christian tradition taught on this matter before the Reformation? Let's start with that before we come to the innovation of the Reformation. Well, the progress of the Christian can be most easily illustrated in this diagram. For most of his or her life, the Christian believer went round and round in the lower part of the circle. If you go to the top, you've got God, you're born, you're baptized, and then you sin. I mean, it just seems to be what we homo sapiens do. We sin. So, we go to confession. We confess our sins. We are absolved by the priest. We go around the little circle there. We do penance, works of satisfaction. We then move into a state of grace, and all seems well, but alas, we sin again. So we go back to confession. We are absolved. We do penance. We enter a state of grace, and alas, we sin again. And so it goes on and on through our lives until, let's come around that circle one more time, we die. We actually die. And then we probably go to purgatory. We're coming up now the, uh, uh, the arc of the circle. And then we spend some time in purgatory and we get to go to heaven and now we're back at the top reunited with God. That was essentially the penitential cycle in late medieval Christianity that Luther was born into. Now there were two schools of thought on this matter. This matter of sin and forgiveness. Uh, the first school was called the Via Moderna, the modern way. Uh, they took the view that the sinner needed to fulfill minimal requirements by doing the best they could. And there's a technical Latin term for this called facere quod in se est. It basically means doing the best you can, doing the best that's within you. So one school of thought said you need to do the best you can, and by so doing you move from evil to good. Now there's Pelagian overtones here. Remember the fifth century? The controversies between Augustine and Pelagius. Pelagius said we have a role in our own salvation. Augustine said, no way, it is all the grace of God. In the later Middle Ages, this school of thought would be represented by people like John of Paltz, Gabriel Beale, Johannes Geiler von Kaisersberg, and others. The other school of thought was the Augustinian perspective. And this stressed the complete priority of grace over human action. And men that represented this school of thought would be Gregory of Rimini and Hugo of Orvieto. From the time of Augustine, in the 5th century to the 16th century, the church had understood justification as the event and the process of being made righteous. Beginning with Luther's colleague, Philip Melanchthon, a notion of forensic justification diverged radically from the medieval Augustinian view. I want to break this down and explain what justification means because this is the core and the heart of what the Reformation was all about. Virtually all major Reformation theologians adopted this view of justification and so it came to represent a standard and radical uh, difference between Protestants and Catholics. But now meanwhile, back to Luther and his idea of justification apart from works and apart from indulgences. Luther comes to understand what he terms the joyous exchange. And what exactly is this joyful, this happy exchange that Luther has in mind. It is quite simply this. 
Divine righteousness is transferred from God to the sinner. And the sins of humankind, like you and me, are transferred to Christ via the cross. This is the joyous exchange. He takes our sins, we get his righteousness. Well, Luther had what he describes as a tower experience, a termerlebnis, an experience that he had at, at some point in his life where he began to understand what had happened, this joyous exchange. It's a theological breakthrough. And the year before he died, Luther recounts this discovery in what I would describe as an autobiographical fragment that I'd like to read to you. Here's Luther on this experience of understanding how we are made righteous. He says, I had certainly wanted to understand Paul in his letter to the Romans, but what prevented me from doing so was not so much cold feet as that one phrase in the first chapter, Romans 1, the righteousness of God is revealed in it, for I hated that phrase. Luther writes, the righteousness of God, I hated it, which I had been taught to understand as the righteousness of God by which God is righteous and punishes unrighteous sinners. Although I lived a blameless life as a monk, I felt that I was a sinner with an uneasy conscience before God. I also could not believe that I had pleased him with my works. Far from loving that righteous God who punished sinners, I actually hated God. Well, this is pretty, uh, pretty strong language, pretty honest opinion coming from Luther. He hated God because he felt like he couldn't measure up to the righteousness God demanded and expected. I was in desperation, he writes, to know what Paul meant in this passage. At last, as I meditated day and night on the relation of the words, the righteousness of God is revealed in it, as it is written, the righteous person shall live by faith, I began to understand, Luther says, I began to understand that the righteousness of God is that by which the righteous pe person lives, by the gift of God, which is faith. And this sentence, the righteousness of God is revealed, to refer to a passive righteousness, by which the merciful God justifies us by faith, as it is written, the righteous person lives by faith. This immediately made me feel as though I had been born again, and as though I had entered through open gates into paradise. From that moment, I saw the whole face of Scripture in a new light. Romans 1, 16 and 17 was Luther's experience that changed his entire understanding of Scripture, God, and theology. Now Paul Luther, Martin's son, claims that this breakthrough came to his father in 1510 or 11 when he was in Rome, that Luther went up the steps on his knees saying a pater noster and a hail Mary on each step. And when he got to the top, he said, oh, for heaven's sake, the just shall live by faith. Well, that's Paul Luther's story. I don't think it's sound. Uh, I don't think there's any historical uh, basis for it because we have Luther's lectures after Rome. The struggle goes on. I think it's far too early. Because the struggle for Luther in the cloister, trying to find righteousness, and the assurance of salvation, and the gracious God beating himself, sleeping on cold floors, fasting, the unfectungen continues to buffet him, and the song goes on, the song that he's trying to learn. I've mentioned previously his confessions, going to Staupitz, struggling, trying to confess every sin in thought, word, and deed, and the frustration of both men. Luther attacked the medieval distinctions between commands 
and counsels of God, the commands of God and the counsels of God, which claimed extra merit for keeping the counsels of poverty, obedience, and chastity. These weren't commands, they were counsels, and if you kept the counsels, you got extra brownie points. Luther objected to the notion of Christ as the intolerant tyrant, demanding perfection from humans, and he also began to object strenuously to the indulgences trade. We've learned what indulgences are. Buying a piece of paper that granted you the remission of sin or the temporal punishment because of that sin. And of course they were hawking the indulgences in Saxony to pay for St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. And Johannes Tetzel, the Dominican, was the one who really got Luther going and got him to reassess his whole position. And somewhere in there he had this tower experience where he discovers Paul. The doctrine of sola fide, faith alone, arose out of Luther's personal struggles and in opposition to the sale of indulgences. This doctrine is the cardinal tenet of the historical Lutheran Reformation. Here I stand. The song was getting extremely high now. Luther's voice is faltering, but it didn't crack. The voice didn't crack. He called the book of Galatians his own. His own. It meant so much to Martin that he called it his own. He was thoroughly Pauline on this point, I think, of justification by faith. And you must read the epistles of Galatians first and then the epistle of Romans to really get a sense of where Paul is coming from. This is a key New Testament early Christian understanding. He disregarded the book of James, a very well-known posture, because James says we're not justified by faith alone, we're justified by faith plus works. Luther said, nonsense, we're not saved by works. Works have nothing to do with salvation. Works have nothing to do with justification. In fact, I'd like to throw Jimmy into the stove, he said. He didn't. James remained in the Luther Bible, but Luther was a bit suspect of the second chapter of James particularly. Some of his critics viewed this as a turn towards antinomianism against the law, that Luther was advocating do whatever you want. That's an invalid and an incorrect perspective on Luther. Now there is the question of works. There's a difference, however, in Luther between works prior to justification and works following justification. It's a very important distinction to observe. Luther writes in his commentary on Galatians, it is impossible that Christ and the law should dwell together in one heart. But if you think that Christ and the law can dwell together, then be sure that Christ does not dwell in your heart. Christ alone justifies me in spite of my evil works and without my good works. Now that's pretty pointed. I am justified in spite of my evil works and quite apart from anything good that I might do. Luther puts it this way, and he puts a very fine point on it when he asks the question, so do we then do nothing? Do we do nothing in order to obtain this righteousness? And Luther answers his own question, I answer nothing at all. For this is perfect righteousness, to do nothing, to hear nothing, to know nothing of the law or of works, but to know and believe that Christ is our high priest, interceding for us and reigning over us and in us by grace. He's learning theology now, and the song is getting really high, but his voice is holding, and the voice isn't breaking. Luther is not going to back off quite yet. In 1527, he wrote a letter to Christians in Riga and several other cities in Estonia, and he noted very important 
on this idea of the forgiveness of sins, that the blood of Christ, without human merit, the blood of Christ without human merit is the means for a proper relationship with God, the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ, he says, is not within the human purview. It isn't something we have any control over. It is not something we can produce. It's only the blood of Jesus. Fastings, prayers, pilgrimages, penance, and all of these sorts of things, masses and vigils, only pretend to do what the blood of Christ really does. The blood of Christ, he says in this letter, has already accomplished what human efforts only feebly attempt to do. The blood of Christ has already accomplished it. And he goes on further and says, indulgences and any of those sorts of things are actually deadly poison. Those are Luther's words, deadly poison. You buy an indulgence to be saved, you're poisoning yourself. You try to do good works in order to put yourself in a proper relationship with God, you're not getting into a proper relationship with God, you are poisoning yourself. In fact, you're hurting yourself. It'd be better if you didn't do anything. This, this led Luther to a startling discovery. A startling discovery indeed. We might call it a theological Copernican revolution. And that's Luther's discovery of Romans 1.17. Now let me say something about Copernicus so you understand why I'm calling this a Copernican revolution. Nicholas Copernicus was a Polish astronomer. Before Copernicus, people believed that the Earth was the center of the universe. That was scientific theory in the Middle Ages. Copernicus got people to see that it was the Sun, not the Earth, that was the center of the universe. Let's take the Copernican model and apply it to Luther. The medieval church had taught and practiced for centuries that the center of this whole thing was me and you, people. Luther said, no, that's the whole point. It isn't about us. The center of religious life is God, God in Christ. By doing good deeds, people hope to make themselves righteous before God. Luther put God, not humans, he put God and the work of God at the center of religion and by so doing removed humans and what humans do from that place. He called on people to let God be God. Stop trying to be God. Stop trying to save yourself. Stop trying to be good. You have to rely upon the work of Jesus Christ. Now some of his detractors thought he'd gone too far. One of the professors at Freiburg write to, wrote to Zwingli in 1519 and said, would that some upright man would urge Luther not to go so far, but to keep to moderation. Well, Luther could not be characterized by moderation in just about anything. Now, the system of the late medieval church was becoming deeply eroded by Protestant theology, especially Luther's. Let's turn our attention now squarely to the doctrine of justification at the time of the European Reformations. The essential solidarity, the basic union among the major reformers like Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, and others, exists principally on the doctrine of justification. It is a distinctive Reformation feature that gave unprecedented priority to this notion of justification by faith. Now that said, the understanding of justification and its essential corollaries, faith and works, became divisive, became a point of conflict between Protestants and Catholics and more than that, even between one group of Protestants here and another group over here. It became a point of contention. The teaching is classically associated with Martin Luther. In Luther's lectures on Romans in 1515 and 1516, he underscores the human inability 
to perform facere quod in est, the ability to do the best you can, whatever is within you. He essentially says that this notion is simply insufficient. There isn't enough good in you to do anything, and what you think is good still stinks. And would refer to scriptures that talk about human righteousness being like filthy rags in the nostrils of God. Now in light of all of this, we do begin to see in the Romans' lectures an emphasis upon grace. And then in 1520 he wrote his little book on Christian liberty. It is a powerful exposition of the doctrine of justification by faith, and he bases it upon Romans and Galatians. Now reformers took the line and took the view that the essence of theology was justification. Because all other theology has to come from there. You have to be in a proper relationship with God in order to really do and develop and understand theology in other dimensions. So it's really the essence of theology, this notion of justification. And reformers and thinkers like Luther perceived it as the dividing line between genuine and false Christians and Christianities. The sinner, quite simply, is justified by God through grace alone, effected through Jesus and received by faith. It's as simple as that. Now Luther understands justification to occur on account of faith. I've used the word faith quite a bit. And it's now appropriate to ask the question, what is faith? What exactly did Luther mean when he said it's through faith that we are placed in a proper relationship with God? Well, let me tell you what it isn't. According to Luther, faith is not correct belief. It is not correct belief, because that's what you do. I believe? No, it's got nothing to do with you. Who cares what you believe? Oh, I understand. Who cares what you understand? When it comes to salvation, what you understand and what you believe is not relevant. So give it up. This is what Luther said. Faith is not on the basis of the human achievement of trusting God. Well, Lord, I believe. Luther says that isn't faith. That's just you. You believe. Well, bully for you. But that doesn't mean you've got faith. Instead, he says, faith is a gift of God. It's something God gives to you, that God puts within you. Let me give you Luther's words on this very crucial point. He says there are two kinds of believing. First, a believing about God, which means that I believe that what is said of God is true. This faith is really a form of knowledge than a faith. There is secondly, a believing in God, which means that I put my trust in God, that I give myself up to thinking that I can have dealings with God and believe without any doubt that God will be and do to me according to the things said of God. Such faith, which throws itself upon God, whether in life or death, alone makes one a Christian. Faith is the pure gift of God. Faith is not a human work. Faith is not intellectual assent. Put it this way. The faith which we believe or the faith by which we believe. I just added one little two-letter word. The faith we believe or the faith by which we believe, and Luther is hammering the second. It's the faith by which we can accept and believe. Oh, faith is a living, active power. These are Luther's words. Wherever there is faith, eternal life has already begun. Faith is a divine work within us. It transforms. It is a living, busy, active, mighty thing, this faith. Faith is a living, daring, confidence in God's grace. This is in Luther's commentary to Romans. God is not to be known through feeling, but through faith. Who cares how you feel? 
Well, I don't feel saved, Dr. Luther. Doesn't matter. Whether you feel saved or not is not the point. God gives faith. Faith receives the righteousness. Faith saves. You don't save yourself. God saves you through yourself, through faith, which is God's gift. Now this discovery comes to Luther through the struggle he experienced in the cloister. It led him to dismiss the teaching of the medieval church on the matter of faith, commonly called fetus caritate formata, faith formed by love, or faith that is formed by doing good works. No, Luther said, you've missed the point again. Your faith does not come from God if you're good. It doesn't come from God if you do the best you can. It doesn't come from God if you perform good works. No, God gives you faith because God loves you in Jesus Christ, in spite of who you are or what you are. Therefore, he says, let these fellows that talk about this go to the devil. Just let them go to the devil who think they can save themselves. Let that expression, faith formed by love, be damned. There, there's a very fine point here. He said it's all monstrosities, creations of the devil trying to get you to think that you're responsible for your salvation. And Luther says, that's how I was deceived. Day and night for years I tried to save myself. I finally came to understand that it is the gift of God that is given to me. This faith, which is sola fide, faith alone, casts itself upon the sufficiency of Christ, taking the ultimate leap, and in so doing takes a chance upon God and upon God's completeness. This sola fide is the active, present power of God in the human existence, according to Luther. For Luther, life in this principle was really a, well, a theological anthropology, if you will, from faith to faith. Here I stand. And you understand when he was at Worms and he said, here I stand, I can't do anything else, God help me. That was a stand for sola fide. That was a stand for justification by faith. Luther had nowhere else to go but to cast himself upon the sufficiency of God. Now you've got to be wondering, what in the world were the responses of the medieval church to this sort of teaching? Well, there were admissions that Luther's redefinitions of faith and grace were absolutely valid and orthodox. I refer to John Fisher in England and Johannes Cochleus in Germany. But they feared the consequences of the teaching. Now there are those who have reduced Luther's idea on the matter to faith versus works. Well, that's really misleading theological shorthand. The vicar general of the Diocese of Constance, Johannes Fabri, extraordinarily remarked in 1520, I agree with almost everything Luther says. I wish that everyone would become real Lutherans. I don't have any problem with it, but you see there's implications to believing in sola fide, justification by faith. Sometimes Luther's opponents vehemently rejected his notion of faith, but they always seem rather uncomfortable with the equivocation of the theological question on this uh, particular topic. So these same controversial theologians opposing Luther elected, chose to ignore most of what he said on faith because church history and historical theology in general appeared opposed to them. And it would be better to simply be quiet. You read the literature against Luther, there's not that much attacking his idea of faith. Well, does this then suggest that the supposed gulf between Luther and the Western Latin Church was really just imagined? Does it mean that the Reformation in the end was just a mistake based on a misunderstanding? I would have to argue no. It is true that the official church and 
the theologians of that church did accept sola fide as the historic faith of the Christian church. How could they do anything else? But that they believed or practiced that doctrine cannot be maintained. They simply did not believe it or practice it. Opposition to Luther's doctrine of faith in the 16th century was not on the grounds that it contravened historic church teaching, but rather in terms of how Luther expressed his view and the perceived effects on the lay people. Well, for myself, I cannot regard these arguments directed against Luther's doctrine of justification and universal priesthood as anything other than weak. These were Luther's most offensive doctrines, the ones most harmful to the official church, and yet these arguments appear to be the strongest his opponents could muster. One can only conclude then that even in the view of Catholic doctors, Luther had neither contradicted revealed truth nor exposed his theological system to be fatally flawed. The monastic experience had taught Luther that justification by faith disallowed the existence of elite special groups of Christians within Christendom who could attain higher levels of holiness and be more spiritual beyond that of ordinary Christians. Just doesn't work. Let's return to Cranach's portrait of Christ as the Redeemer on the cross. This is the center. Luther stands there with Cranach himself and John Baptist. There is nothing else but the sufficiency of Jesus and the shed blood. Now part of the issue on this topic has to do with the significance of interpreting St. Paul the Apostle. Uh, Luther argues in his large catechism, I'm sorry, his large commentary on uh, Galatians that righteousness is not of the law. Righteousness is not of the law. It can't be presented to God. Say, hey God, look at this. Look what I've done. Luther says you simply can't do that. Good works will be part of it, but good works follow justification. They don't precede it. They don't facilitate it. Justification means to be in Christ. Justification means to be made righteous apart from yourself. Well, the cloister made that pretty clear to Luther. Think of all of the good works he tried to go through and he could not become righteous. However, in his cell, in the Augustinian house at Erfurt, Luther had learned a powerful lesson. He wrote a letter to his old father superior, Johannes von Staupitz, in March 1518. Luther said in that letter, Yes, I know that many people despise me and are critical of me. I teach that people should trust in nothing except Jesus Christ alone, not in their own prayers or merits or works, because we are saved only, only by the mercy of God. Now there is a simple language. We are saved only by the mercy of God. Well, was all of this just Martin Luther? I've talked for some time now about the forgiveness of sins, the idea of faith, and the doctrine of justification. Some might say, well, that's all very interesting, but that's just Martin Luther. That was Luther's understanding based on his interpretation of Paul. So what I want to do before coming to a conclusion in this particular lecture is to ask the question about justification of a number of other reformers and see what we come up with. The Protestant teaching on this matter, justification, forgiveness of sins, appears to have appealed to many people, especially those anxious about their own sin or those lacking in the assurance of salvation. Forensic justification. Melanchthon used that term. 
It's really a legal pronouncement by God. It's, a, it's almost as if you've come up for trial and you're standing in the dock before the judge and you're being tried on the basis of who you are. The doctrine of justification is quite simply this. The unrighteousness of humanity is addressed juridically by a righteous judge, that'd be God, and the legal guilt of sin in humankind, which you're full of, the judgment comes down, not guilty. That's what forensic justification means. You are absolutely guilty, but the righteous judge says you're not guilty. On what basis? On the basis that Christ died for your sins. On the basis of the joyous exchange. To put it to you this way, when God looks at a sinner, Luther would say, God does not see the sin at all. God sees the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, the joyous exchange. Well, this concept eliminates any solid consideration of facere quod and say, yes, this notion of doing the best that's in you, which late medieval theology understood as a precondition to divine ex uh, acceptance. The only way God's going to accept you is if you do the best you can. Be a good little boy, a good little girl. Try to do everything good and maybe, just maybe, you'll get some candy in your Christmas stocking. Luther says, no, it doesn't matter because it's all about God. It's all about the cross. It's all about the blood. It's not about you. It likewise curtailed any consideration of Pelagian tendencies, of what you might contribute. Okay, the sin question is resolved in this way. Divine righteousness is transferred to the sinner. The sins of the person are transferred to Christ through the cross. The joyous exchange. What about the moral implications? What about the legal implications? It's all subsumed in the cross. Now Luther, he predicated his understanding on an Augustinian concept of grace, but he made two significant departures from St. Augustine. First, that the justifying righteousness is alien. It's not inherent to us. It's not something that's in there. That if you blow on the spark that's within you, it'll burst into flame. That's inherent righteousness. Luther says, no, no, no. There's nothing in you that's good. It's an alien righteousness that comes from God into us through the cross, through divine grace. And second, that justification involves two distinct elements. Now, unlike Melanchthon's forensic justification, for Luther it does involve a personal encounter between Christ and the believer. What about some of the other reformers? Andreas Osiander. Well, for Osiander, Christ effects justification by infusing divine righteousness through faith. Reconciliation with God takes place through the union of divine righteousness with the believer. And in justification, believers become partakers of the divine nature. Martin Chemnitz, justification, he taught, is absolution from sin. It is the remission of sin through the imputation. It's a big word, but it's imputed. It's brought into you, given to you through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It's apprehended by faith. Heinrich Bullinger in Zurich held that God justifies and sanctifies all at once. Justification is adoption into a pattern of sanctification wherein the damaged image of God is gradually restored, culminating, of course, in complete salvation. Martin Bootser argued it was impossible to be justified without being morally renewed at the same time. And he developed a theory of double justification, justification by faith and justification by good works, the latter 
proves the former. Luther wouldn't like the language, but I think he would agree with the content. And in this way, Bootser reconciles Paul and James, who look like they're batting heads. John Calvin was convinced that Luther's claim of justification, sola fide, apart from works, was the major turning point, and insisted that the notion of justification by faith was the principal article of the entire Christian religion. Philip Melanchthon, whom I've mentioned several times, argued that justification should be understood as a declaration of righteousness rather than a making righteous. It's a being declared righteous by God. For Augustine, uh, there are some similarities. There's a relationship then between forgiveness and renewal. One can't experience the one without the other. Peter Martyr, he said justification is the head, the fountain, and the summit of all piety. He argues from three vantage points. Good works don't justify. Faith justifies. Faith alone justifies. And like Bullinger, he includes regeneration under the rubric of justification. And once again, you see these reformers completely rejecting the medieval church teaching on salvation. They're rejecting Pelagianism as well. Radical reformers like Andreas Karlstadt was relatively uninterested in forensic justification. He focused on social renewal and religious matters. Menno Simons taught that salvation by grace must be supplemented with discipleship. Caspar Schwinkfeld taught that faith proved itself by moral change and by its works. Balthasar Hubmeier, we'll be looking at some of these radical reformers in another session, said mere faith doesn't deserve to be called faith, for a true faith can never exist without deeds. Now there's a danger in Luther. The emphasis upon forensic justification and Christian freedom could be used to tolerate lax morals. Hence, John Agricola's antinomianism, which can be summed up this way, free from the law. Oh, blessed condition. I can sin as I please and still have remission. That's not what Luther was saying. Or as W.H. Auden puts it in the Christmas Oratorio, he has uh, Caiaphas say, I like to sin. God likes to forgive. The world is admirably arranged. That is not what Luther is on about. For Agricola, the law has no place and no role. It isn't necessary in order to bring sinners to repentance. Luther, Melanchthon, and most of the reformers withstood him. Now the official church tended to misunderstand the Protestant doctrine of justification. Assuming that justification was achieved through faith, which they thought was a human effort. The extensive treatment, however, of the teaching by the Council of Trent in the 1550s and 60s is witness to the importance of the teaching in the 16th century. So to summarize all of this, for Luther, for many of the reformers, justification is a forensic justification, declaration, rather than a process. It's a change in status rather than in nature. The distinctions are made and maintained, and there is no basis because of the alien righteousness that comes to say that good works contribute to salvation. The devil is therefore completely bound. Well, Luther's Unfechtungen continues. He lives and he died. He's damned. He lives again. His theology takes hold. The song was heard, sung, and it tested Luther's voice to the absolute limit. But he sang, and the song was, in the end, despite his initial fears about it being 
too high for his voice, held. It was a song of faith, of trust in God's grace. A song he learned in the monastery, in the struggle. A song that sustained Luther through his extraordinary life. A theme that challenged the Christian church right down to its foundations, but it didn't destroy the church. Because Jesus had said, upon this rock, I will build my church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it.